this seat, the buzz and the energy in the room, anticipate uh, what else is going on in our lives with the Spirit speaking to us today. A few announcements here this morning. Uh, a couple reminders for us coming up. Um, for those of you uh, who are not here on New Year's Eve, again, we're, we've talked about this a couple times with our uh, a little prayer request slip of something for you spiritually this year that you feel like you want to uh, work on. Uh, those of us here in leadership at uh, Woodstock Bible Church would like to know about that. If you are uh, watching online and hearing this also, and you would like to have be included in that, we would like to include you in that also. And if you have that uh, prayer slip request for us, you can either hand it to John or myself. For those of you online who may be watching, you can mail that into the church, and we will do that as well. Uh, commit to praying for each of you through that. A reminder, next Monday, a week from tomorrow, is our annual business meeting, 7.30 p.m. here at church. So please mark your calendars. We would love for everybody to attend that meeting. There's a lot of stuff to talk about and um, a lot of voting that has to be done also. Those of you who know for sure that you're not gonna be able to make it, we have absentee ballots made up this morning. You need to see Ben Heath, our business deacon, if you know for sure that you're not gonna be here and get a absentee ballot from him. Another reminder, in two weeks from today, February 7th, we will be having communion, and that will follow immediately after our morning worship service, kind of similar to how we've done it the last couple times. Um, we'll take a short intermission and a break, and then we'll, we'll have our communion service. Okay, we will um, turn to the Lord in prayer here shortly. Uh, then we will continue with our music and worship time. The children will be dismissed after the worship time, and then John will be coming up for bringing us the word. So let's pause now and uh, turn to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you that we have a God we can turn to. We thank you that in the midst of uh, uncertainty, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of maybe good times and in the midst of when things seem to be going well for us. Father, in all of those situations, we can come to you, we can turn to you, and we know, we believe, and we understand you hear us, and that you, Father, as we reach out to you, um, give us encouragement. As we reach out to you, Father, you empower us, and you enable us to um, accomplish the things that you have for us in our lives. Lord, if we're struggling with health issues, if we're struggling with um, just personal issues, if we're struggling with fill in the blank for us, Father, we bring those things to you this morning. We ask, Lord, that you meet those needs, that you hear those needs, and that you fill those needs with your presence. Lord, we think of all these prayer requests of, of those who are struggling now with health issues, with, with COVID. We think of uh, Johnny's mom and grandma. We think of the, the coordinates down in Las Vegas. Lord, we lift them up in prayer to you. We know that in um, the snap of a finger, you could make them well. We know that in the snap of a finger, you could take COVID away from this world and wipe it out. But Lord, we know that in, in that, you are working in some way and help us, Father, to understand what that means. And we just lift those up in prayer, Father, those who are dealing with that and struggling with that. Pray that you would encourage them and give them strength and healing. Lord, we think of the Brambolo family and Ravine as he's having surgery again this afternoon. Lord, just have a special presence in their, in their family and in their, in their lives. Lord, we just bring them to you and know and ask and pray that you meet those needs and that you would guide the doctors and, and help them to figure out what's going on and in the best way to be able to treat them. Lord, we lift up the Wagners to you. We pray for Ron that you would help him and give him strength. And we pray for the Van Comers as they lost their sister. Lord, we just pray that you would help them through this and encourage them, comfort them, and we ask that you would give them the strength to deal with um, all the issues that go along with that, Lord. We thank you so much for what you do for us, and we continue to lift up uh, Renee and her issues with her Crohn's disease. Lord, we just pray that, again, as doctors treat and, and help her, that you would uh, just strengthen her and give her the strength that she needs and just come into her heart and into her mind and fill that in a way that only you could do, Father. Lord, as we focus now towards your word and as we focus towards worship. Help us, Father, in our minds to clear away distractions. Help us in our hearts to be open to your Holy Spirit speaking to us, to move in us, and we just pray, Father, that as we uh, hear your word and as we sing praises, 
Lord, that, that would be a life-altering uh, event for us this morning. We pray for John as he's going to bring the word. I ask that you would encourage him and give him the words that he needs to have, the words that we need to hear, Lord, and we just pray that it would fall on fertile ground and be planted in our hearts and our minds. Lord, we love you this morning. We praise you. We honor you. We want to turn this time over to you and ask that you would just fill it with your presence. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. No screen? Okay, this morning we're going to sing some songs we normally don't sing, so you pay attention and get your books. We're going to start this morning with number uh, 175 in your blue books that you have in your pews. 175, Jesus Hold My Hand. And we'll sing all three verses.
I'll meet you in the morning and we'll sing all three verses.
verses 1, 2, and 4.
be honest with you, I don't think I could have kept up with flipping the slides to those songs anyway. <laughs> so it probably would have been a fool's errand. Um, we're going to be continuing on in our series about uh, God's wisdom in Proverbs. So I'm going to invite everybody to open up, please, to Proverbs chapter 4. Before we look into God's Word, I do have another announcement. This was my slide. I prepared for this. I'm so glad we were able to get it up. Um, actually, I didn't prepare it. I just yanked it off the internet and put it on here. But uh, as, we, I, as I announced last week on Sunday night, starting Wednesday, February 10th, for Wednesday night, we'll be going through a book um, called How to Pray by Pete Gregg. And there's a resource online called The Prayer Course that aligns with the book. And it's just simply called An Eight-Week Journey Through the Lord's Prayer. The book itself is not going to change your life. The Bible is what changes your life. But what the book might do, or what my prayer is, is it might want you to change, uh, might encourage you to change your life with regards to prayer. Predominantly, a lot of the slips of paper that we receive regarding people's desires for the new year and their spiritual life, uh, most of them had to do with a more intense and personal study of God's Word. Quite a few mentioned they need a deeper prayer life or would like to grow in prayer as well. I can guarantee you that the time and the focus and the material that we cover in this eight week course is going to help you be more excited about those prospects. So if you would like to join us in our journey, and I encourage everyone to do it, there is a box of books on the back, in the back fellowship hall that I'm gonna ask you to grab one per household um, so that you can be ready for that when it starts. Now, there's going to be a sign-up sheet there. I, I ordered 25 books. I anticipate, I want everybody to want one, um, but I wanted to be wise with the stewards. So we run out of books today. We still have time to order more. That's not a problem. The sign-up sheet, you just simply put your name. You put what book number you have. There should be a little number on the book so we can keep track of who has what. And then whether you'll be attending Wednesday night in person or via Zoom. Because we want you to have the book so that you can participate in our fellowship as a church around these issues. Um, if for some reason there is a problem with being here in person, and I'm open to this again as we think about moving in in a couple of weeks of doing this, if 7 o'clock is too early for you, I would like to hear that feedback. If you could be here at 7.30 and that's a difference for you, whether you can attend or not, please let me know that and we can take that into account. But again, I would encourage everyone, this is really, I think, has the potential to help us be more excited about prayer. If you have more questions about that, obviously feel free to talk to me afterwards. Wisdom is a tree of life. So we're going to be looking at, did I say Proverbs 4? Yep. Haha, -ha, joke's on you, it's actually Proverbs 3. Um, I was studying Proverbs 4 uh, and 5 yesterday, and so I had that on the brain evidently. I'm, I apologize for that. It's Proverbs chapter 3. And I'm entitled again, Wisdom is a Tree of Life. And uh, most of you probably... If you have spent some time in Proverbs 3, your devotional life is probably focused on Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Those are kind of the money verses that especially a lot of new believers, they really hang a lot of their spiritual faith and emphasis on those verses because they want God to direct their path. And they want to be on a good path. And so just a reminder, it's some review of what we talked about when we looked at Proverbs 2. God desires wise children. And Jesus said, anyone who is wise will put into practice what he says. James in the New Testament says, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God. God wants his children to be wise. Wisdom is important. Wisdom is commanded. And wisdom is accessible. God's wisdom is not just for the precious few Christians who ascend the mountain and get to the top. 
God wants to make his wisdom available to everyone. He has made his wisdom available to everyone. And so if you in your own heart think that wisdom is something that you achieve as a guru at the top of you know, Mount Everest or something, you have missed the point of what Proverbs chapter 2 is about. We are encouraged to seek wisdom. God would not encourage us to seek something that wasn't really available. And so we have an opportunity as his children to grow in his wisdom. Now that's the key word there, his wisdom. Not the wisdom of the world and that we a sermon down the road, but for today we're just focusing on this idea that wisdom is a tree of life. God's wisdom leads us to every good path. Let's read our text. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father the son he delights in. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver, and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. By wisdom the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the watery depths were divided, and the clouds let drop the dew. My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be life for you, an ornament to grace your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is your, in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you when you already have it with you. Do not plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse anyone for no reason when they have done you no harm. Do not envy the violent or choose any of their ways for the Lord detests the perverse but takes the upright into his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. The wise inherit honor, but fools get only shame. I would like to start our meditation on Proverbs 3, looking at verses 7 and verses 18. And what I'm going to suggest to you is the writer of Proverbs here is harking us back to the Garden of Eden. And if you look at uh, those two verses, 7 and 18, we are seeing an echo of, what the, of the choice that God gave Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. There's the tree of life and there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Wisdom always involves a choice. That's why I can say confidently that God's wisdom is accessible because God says you can choose it. You can choose it. And the choice is a simple decision between two trees. Often in life, we complicate things that aren't really that complicated. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil versus the tree of life. So what I'm going to suggest is the Bible continues to return to these themes in Proverbs here, in Proverbs 3, I think knowingly, I think mindfully, cast out this vision 
to the audience here, you can choose wisdom, which is a tree of life, or in verse 7, you could try to be wise in your own eyes. You could try to do what feels right for you. And that's a choice that we face more often probably than we think about. But it is a choice. It is a choice. Life versus death. God wants wise children who choose life. And we know this because he told his children in the Old Testament this very message. If you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 to 20, I think it's probably wise that we go there. So let's take a moment to just reinforce this particular concept. If you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and you look at verses 15 through 20, this is one of those times where God lays it out straight to the people of Israel, to his people. And notice the way it's framed in verse 15. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, decrees and laws, and then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to the other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will not, you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth to, as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give you to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God wants his wise children to always choose life. That is a principle that runs through the Old Testament, and it is a principle that runs through the New Testament. Wisdom is a choice. There's two trees always before us. So the tree of life, what does that really mean? Well, in the context of Genesis 3, in the context of what we just read in Deuteronomy, in the context of what we read here in Proverbs, it is doing what is right in God's sight, choosing every good path and partaking in the divine life. So we touch life. We become animated by life when we find ourselves in line with what God has asked us to do, what he's called us to do, what he wants us to do, what pleases him. And so we've been told in Proverbs 3 that wisdom is a tree of life, that we touch God's life when we seek his wisdom. And essentially what is happening is, you know, as Adam and Eve chose incorrectly in the Garden of Eden, through Jesus Christ, who himself said he was the way, the truth, and the life, we get a reset. We don't have to live out the tragedy of the Garden of Eden. Once Christ enters into our life and we choose life, his life, for our life, now we can start to incorporate God's wisdom and his every good path into our spiritual life. And that's why when we talk about rebirth, that's why it has to happen. When we talk about renewing our mind, that's why it has to happen. Because instead of constantly choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we can now choose the tree of life, and we can keep choosing it. And we can find, as the proverb lays out here, blessing in that. We can find encouragement in that. We can find nourishment in that. That's the choice that God puts before his people, his children. The other choice is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the writer of Proverbs here, talking to us, said, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Do not be wise in your own eyes. That is the challenge of God's children, that we would seek to move that choice out of our mindset. We think we know better more often than we really do. And Proverbs has a lot to say about that particular principle, so I don't want to spend a lot of time expanding on it today, but we will cover it. This idea that often in life we feel like we've got a pretty good handle on things, it turns out we really don't. It seemed right in our own eyes, but it's turning out badly. Why, why do I keep doing this thing that turns out badly? We ask ourselves that question and we kind of perplex ourselves sometimes. And God often has to tell us, it's actually not as complicated as you are making it. 
Choose life. Choose me. Now, there are some life principles that I would like to review now in this particular proverb that Proverbs reverberates throughout the entire book. And so I just call these some life principles. Now, here's the issue. Often in life, often in life you will hear people say things like, well, I'm having some money problems right now. Or I've got some relationship problems. Or, you know, i got a problem with anger. And those are probably true, but they're not necessarily... They're diagnosing symptoms and not going back to the root, which is the tree of life. If you have money problems, you have a wisdom problem. If you have a problem in your relationships, you have a wisdom problem. If you have a problem, um, you know, flying off the handle and saying things that are inappropriate and offending people, you have a wisdom problem. These aren't little tweaks to the system. There's something wrong with that initial choice that you're making in your life between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Doing what is right in your own eyes usually leads to problems. I think that's one of the main messages that we get from Scripture. And so these life principles that I'm going to sort of walk through here in Proverbs 3 are all part of a big tapestry. They're part of a big picture. It's not like work on this and then work on that and then maybe you'll get to this. It's understand that every time you choose life, you are going to be avoiding that pathway of the knowledge of good and evil. And I, plead, I hope you really notice the theme in this chapter is blessing. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves God wants to bless us. He does. And if you don't trust that about God, your relationship is probably suffering in some way because you're not being honest with him. He wants to bless you. He wants to pour out blessings into your life. And he's asking, why won't you just choose me so I can do that? I want to talk first, this first life principle that's brought out, in verses 9 and 10, where God talks about the way that we should honor him with our wealth. Wisdom with money. And as I walk through these, I'm not going to be able to give them a full treatment. But just let it kind of percolate there, and let it sort of sit. And if it is striking a chord with you, take that to the Lord and ask him, Lord, what is it you would have me do with this idea? I would ask the question that I think the scripture is posing. How excited are you about choosing generosity and wise stewardship? Is that a tree of life choice in your life? 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. You know, that's a New Testament principle that is borne out in this text today. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. The Apostle Paul says, you can choose life with your money by being generous. How excited are you about choosing off the tree of, tree of life, generosity? You, seeing your funds as a way to bless others. One of the legacies that my father-in-law, Dwayne, uh, I remember him oftentimes, one of the things he would get most excited about when he was talking about things was, you know, he would say, it's kind of fun when you get a little extra money in the, the month and you can figure out who to give it to. And I used to always think, that doesn't seem very fun to me. But, you know, 25 years later, I can see the wisdom in that kind of statement. He was excited when he came across, there was a little extra that came in in the month, and, you know, oh, who can we, who does God want me to distribute this to? It'll be a surprise to him, they won't be expecting it. That's exciting. Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Jesus himself says in Luke 6, 38, Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. We don't have money problems. We have wisdom problems. We have problems sometimes trusting the Lord in this very clear principle that God loves a cheerful giver and God wants a generous heart. Another principle we find here is verses 11 and 12. When, and this is again quoted in the book of Hebrews. You see how this, this wisdom embedded in the book of Proverbs reverberates through the New Testament. Uh, verses 11 and 12 talk about wisdom through adversity when we experience discipline. And the, the, proverb, the writer of Proverbs says, don't hate that when you experience challenges and trials in your life. 
Don't hate it. God loves you through that. And so wise children who are choosing the tree of life are going to see their trials as their father leading them to a good path. It takes grace, it takes faith to see that. But if God wants us on every good path and he's offering us, and he's, he's asking us to choose him and choose life, then we can see even our trials as a way for him. He's orchestrating ways that we can be put on that good path. Maybe we would not be directed to the better path that he has for us if it were not for this adversity, if it were not for these trials. And I get it. It's hard to understand how we're being going to the hospital time after time after time is God's wisdom. It's tough to trust that sometimes. But as you understand all the facets of God's character and the blessings that he wants to pour out in our life, that's where the faith comes in. That's where the trust comes in. That's where the honesty and prayer comes in with our relationship with God. Now, amongst Christians, this is not a conventional view. Amongst the world, it definitely isn't. If something's not going right, if something bad happens, our first impulse is to find out who's responsible. Who can we blame? Even if it's kind of clear that we're the ones who messed things up, well, who else was complicit in this? It's the blame game. Or sometimes, you know, we put it all on ourselves. Where did I go wrong? What did I mess up? And we don't, and maybe there wasn't anything that we could have done differently. Maybe we, maybe we didn't misread the signs. Maybe we didn't have a, a misunderstanding of something. Maybe just something, somebody made a bad choice that affects us. Or maybe this is the way things worked out. We get sick. The car blows a tire. It's things you can't explain necessarily. We have to see these adversities, we have to see these things as our good father wanting to put us on a good path. So sometimes, sometimes, without wisdom, when the tough times come, the long knives come out. Who are we going to blame? And sometimes it's easy to blame political people, sometimes it's easy to blame church leaders, or whoever seems to be in our way. And instead of really thinking through, Lord, what am I supposed to learn through this? We start to load up the ammunition and see who we can point our fire towards. That's not the path of wisdom. Verses 27 through 30 speak to us about our relationships and wisdom towards our fellow man and our neighbors. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is your power to act, and do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you. This sounds a lot like Jesus' teaching on loving your neighbor, doesn't it? It sounds a lot like what the Good Samaritan did in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Are you seeing this connection? As Jesus tries to establish the ways of the kingdom, he is not developing a new thing. He's actually deriving this wisdom from the Proverbs. So I've, I have confidence that the Proverbs were divinely inspired because I see so much of Christ's own teaching found here. Christ fulfilling it in his own life as he chose life. So being unwise is just following the status quo, looking for ways to get ahead in our relationships or with our neighbors, and at least not fall behind. Uh, I had an experience in a supermarket, I mean, I'm not going to say the name, you might know it if I give you enough clues, but in a particular supermarket, I was having a rough day finding everything I needed. And I'd run around to all four corners of the store, and once I got in line, I was like four deep in the line, and the particular person running the register in that line was not in a hurry. And I had somewhere I kind of had to be or something I had to get to. And then I realized, oh, no, I forgot this one thing. And so I had to make that sort of, you know, Sophie's choice of do I just stay in line and not get the thing and some, someone else is going to have to pick it up later or do I just leave my spot in line? So I chose to leave my spot in line. I ran to go get it, came back, and I lost my spot. And so I chose a different line. Maybe this will go quicker. And I stood there, and I was about three deep, and this person working the, ca the cashier position wasn't working any more quickly and that's you know you start to have some ungodly things dwell up in you and out of the corner of my eye I saw this older woman looking at me and she came over to me I was so glad I had my mask on and she said would you mind I have a piano lesson in 30 minutes could you mind if I stepped in front of you in line and I had like this primal fury rise up in me and again I'm glad that my, my face was veiled because I'm sure the look on my face would have been not pleasant. Not, I didn't choose the tree of life in that situation. 
And the young, the young kid, there's a younger guy ahead of me, real big, tall guy. Oh, yeah, you can come in front of me, no problem. He said, I need some good karma. So I thought about that, reflected for about 30 seconds. I'm like, well, this guy has the right heart. I'm not sure where his theology is, but that's, uh, that's probably the attitude. I should, I should have been eager to offer her my spot. And so I, she moved into that spot. I moved into a different line trying to <laughs> wager. And then I, she, said, and she turned around and thanked us both again. Thank you for letting me in front. And I said, oh, it's no problem. It's not a big deal. I said that, but it still felt like a big deal to me. <laughs> well, that's kind of a microcosm of sometimes the way we go through life, isn't it? Like, I just got to get ahead, or at least I got to stay even with everybody else. And there's these, all these people who need stuff, or I want to kind of get my way. I feel like I deserve a break here and there. And the writer of Proverbs here, what we're seeing here in this wisdom is, uh, how about just thinking about it in terms of what good you can do? Don't withhold good from people. If someone needs to cut you in line, and it seems like they have a good reason, why withhold that good? Choose life. I'll pour out some blessing on you. Do you trust that God's going to take care of you if you let somebody go ahead of you in line? Still wrestling with that one, by the way. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't feel good about sharing that story with you. Let's put it that way. But I think it's instructive. So being wise towards others breathes life into our relationships. It shows, and it should have showed that woman, even though I did not reflect God's wisdom in that experience, it shows that the Spirit of God is among us. And that the brokenness of the world can be effectively combated by life in Jesus. Wisdom that comes from the tree of life speaks to the Spirit of God. It testifies to the Spirit of God and His presence in a very broken and a very needy world. Speaking of that, as we look at verses 31 to 35, we have some pretty strong words here about not envying the violent. We should have wisdom towards evil. And we should all soberly reflect on the fact, how disappointed is God when the church starts to mimic the ways of the world to gain power or influence? How sad is God when we stoop to the world's level? Well, they did it first, so we may as well do it back. If you can find that in scripture anywhere, I'm happy to discuss it with you. I don't see it. Choosing the tree of life sometimes means you're going to have to appear to be the weak one or the meek one, or the humble one. And the church can flex its muscles all at once in the political realm, but if we're giving off a bad testimony, I wonder what's really been accomplished. And of course, we're not to envy the violent. Because God is wise. I know that goes without saying. God knows that anything you gain by violence can be taken away by that same violence. God's kingdom does not march based upon how big your gun is. God says, by my spirit, not by might, not by power. And any attempt to twist the truth to justify our actions is perverse. It's a perversity to God. So these verses here, while they may not speak to us individually, like I, I'm not calling anybody out here, I have no special insight into anybody who has this problem. I do have a problem sometimes in the wider Christian witness there seems to be an over-concern over winning and not enough over advancing the kingdom and the gospel in the spiritual realm. Finally, I'd like to take us back to verses 5 and 6. You might say, well, John, you, you skipped over the most important verses. And for you, they still might be the most important verses. I didn't really skip over them. We just, uh, in the interest of time, I windowed things down a little bit. I think what those verses should tell us is that every day, that should say we have the chance to choose life. We even have the chance to choose life, I guess, too. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him. Now, in all your ways, I think we touched on a few of them today. Proverbs 3 touches on a few of them. In all your ways, in the scope of the decisions and choices you make, God is saying, choose life. Wisdom is a tree of life. And if you choose those things, he has promises for you, including your paths being straight. Every good path will be straight for you. And all, if you look at all the blessing verses in this chapter, they're in abundance. Every day you have this choice. Every day we can submit to him 
and have our paths straighten. And it's not, it doesn't mean it's always going to be an easy road, but it will be a good road. And there is even blessing in knowing that you're on the good road and not the easy road. Finding goodness in this life is about desiring God's wisdom and trusting Him once you receive it. Once you, God reminds you or once God reveals to you the path that you're supposed to take, the decision that you should uh, make or the, the choice that you should make, once He reveals that, we trust Him that we're going to receive His wisdom and His blessing through that. But there is a problem. Still, sometimes, God's children think they're on the right path when they're really not. And Proverbs has a lot to say about that, too. That'll be next week's sermon. What about when we really feel like we're in the group and things fall apart? What accounts for that? There's more that we need to learn. There's more wisdom that God needs to pour into our life. So, Lord willing, next Sunday, we'll be looking into that a little bit further. I pray that God blesses his word today. <coughs>
Let's all stand for a closing prayer. Father, we thank you for our service today. We thank you for the message that you have brought. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for your wisdom, which you are willing to share with us. You call us to seek. We pray that you would help us to be attentive to the situations in our life where we need your wisdom, that you would help us to want more of it, to ask for more of it. We pray that you would bless us as we go today, help us to do what is good, help us to be an encouragement to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Quick reminder, if you're not going to be at our business meeting, Ben has the absentee ballots. Please grab one of those. And also, if you can pass the blue books towards the center so they can, they can get collected easily. And the, books in the back. and the Wednesday night books in the back. If you are planning to be a part of that, please head back to the back there and the sign-up sheet and grab one of those books. God bless you this week.